Okay, next uh, we have Liz Neely, who's the executive director of the Story Collider, which focuses on true personal stories of science told, uh, told live on stage and blends the best ideas from the arts with the strongest research on communication. It's a very unique and innovative approach. She helps scientists tell more compelling stories about their work. Um, and she's also now a member of the advisory board uh, to the comms lab at MIT and previously with Compass and affiliate staff at the University of Washington. Her work, in my opinion, and that of, of her colleagues, reminds us that the arts and humanities play a vital role in scientific advancement. The former help us help teach us uh, what it means to be human, and the latter maybe help us design a world where we can last. So, Liz Neely. Thank you. Oh, and the title of her talk will be uh, The Value of Storytelling in Public Health and Medicine. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to uh, represent a break from what's come before. I'm not a scientist. Uh, but I have built my career on encouraging those who would engage in science communication to really attend to the kind of work we're discussing here today, to evidence and data-driven communications advice. Um, the people in this room are some of my own heroes. Their faces and papers plaster my slides, and I, I use their names as a litany when I'm teaching, you know, Kahan and Kahneman and Scheufele and Nisbet and, and all the rest of them. And when I take a step back and conceive of what health science communication looks like, really in the most broad sense, uh, it starts to become a little bit overwhelming when we're thinking about everything from doctors and patients to uh, public health campaigns to even I started thinking about my own family. How do I take everything I have learned today at this meeting, sort of in this context, and apply it to my parents as they age, or my sisters struggling with making choices about my nieces and nephews. And I could start to feel my heart pounding. The heartbeat is such an intimate sense, right? And I realized this is where I started the paper that I contributed to this conference. Uh, this pounding, this lub-dub sound, tells us all sorts of useful and information about our atriums, our ventricles, right? And it's enclosed in the bony rib cage. So we were not able to access it particularly easily up until the invention of the stethoscope, which is now one of the most iconic pieces when you think about medicine, you think of a stethoscope. Um, the way that this came about, as the story goes, is that a French doctor, uh, through a combination of embarrassment and modesty and, and facing a, a particularly obese female patient, um, realized he could not press his ear to her chest and instead, in a moment of inspiration, rolled up a tight piece of paper and created a tube. That was the first version of the stethoscope. It turned into a wooden version, about a foot long. Uh, but this tool, even though now it is so iconic, it was not a foregone conclusion that it was going to be widely adopted. And in fact, in the English translation of, of the book describing the stethoscope, Sir John Forbes is accused of making one of the worst prophecies in the history of, of medicine, saying um, that it will ever come into general use. I'm extremely doubtful. Um, because, of course, the beneficial application of the stethoscope uh, is troublesome to patients and doctors alike. It takes a lot of time. And beyond that, it's just weird, kind of creepy. We have to learn something new. <laughs> And I think this provides a, a powerful metaphor for storytelling. It is a, a unique listening device available to us that might feel a bit uncomfortable or out of place. It goes against sort of normal practice in some of the fields that we've been developing. Um, and I think that we need to consider it closely. So in the case that I'm making today, I'm, I want to focus on storytelling as both a listening tool as well as a messaging or broadcast tool. And so when the question becomes, why stories? I know we run into definitions. And in an academic sense, story, storytelling, narrative, all have specific meanings, sometimes quite complex, and often conflicting with our daily use. Um, what I'm saying today is that through telling stories and listening to stories and eliciting stories in the context of health science communication, we allow all parties involved to give voice to their experiences. We can bear witness to human suffering. And we also connect our knowledge to action. So 
I have to admit first, storytelling does not come naturally to me and I was extremely skeptical about this for a very long time because I do have a background in science and so for me storytelling meant hand waving. It's what we do when our data is not strong enough and we want to sort of dazzle, right? Storytelling also sometimes has this connotation of, of childhood or fairy tales, pleasant myths that we tell ourselves to get through life. There's really fascinating work that you can do to trace the history of stories and the way that uh, abutting populations will actually reject each other's stories and fairy tales. So th this is a human project and it's exciting. What it boils down to though, I think, are two things. The first is characters and the second is causality. So people experiencing changes having feelings about those, making decisions, and then more changes happening because of that. You recognize this because we are all steeped in stories all the time. And in popular media, you see things like, um, and in, in, our, in our fairy tales, you recognize this cadence. Once upon a time, this is the way the world was, and every day the world was still that way. But then one day, there's some sort of catalytic event. Because of that, because of that, because of that, until finally we have some kind of resolution and the world is never the same again. So stories have this beginning, middle, and end where something changes over the course of them. In my initial forays into storytelling, because I have to admit right now it's also a huge buzzword in everything from business practices and leadership to health science communication and all the rest of it, everything that doesn't suck is a story, or so we seem to think. And so I had this very linear view, right? A uh, storyteller, and then I tell a story, and it goes to my audience, and hopefully has some sort of like educational or persuasive outcome, right? Dead simple. Except I know better. I studied fish. Do you remember beta fish, the fighting fish? Um, you take two males, throw them in a tank, they'll fight. And so one way of saying we can anal analyze this scientifically is to ask, how does their body size or their fin shape or their your behaviors as they escalate these interactions determine the outcomes of those fights? But where it gets really interesting is when you put a third fish in that tank behind a piece of glass so they're just an observer. If it's another male, they escalate those, those fights more rapidly because they're basically fighting a future fight. They want to just get it over with, done. If it's a female, on the other hand, then suddenly we start to flare our gill coverings. We're like, look at my fins. It's amazing. So eavesdropper effects, observer effects matter. And stories are always changing. There are these living things that are in an interplay between the person delivering them, the narrator, the content of the story itself and the way we gloss over parts of it or presume shared knowledge and background. And then the audience in the feedback that you're giving to me, whether your eyes are glazing over, whether you're nodding and smiling. So as I mentioned, I'm a fish person. Started off in marine biology. I was really interested in the evolution of color patterns and visual systems in tropical reef fish. And this was the way that I conceived of and presented my work. In fact, I had what I thought was an amazing elevator speech. I kid you not, I actually would say out loud, what do I study? Oh, I study the synonymous to non-synonymous substitution ratios in the transmembrane regions of rasses. Right? <laughs> Nailed it. Um, so yes, I was interested in rhodopsins, but what I didn't know is what I was really trying to understand was the way that these fish saw each other and saw the world. And there's a useful concept called umwelt, which in my work sort of captured the sensory experience, things like bees with UV vision or electromagnetic senses that we don't have. But I pulled that as sort of a, a metaphor and um, thought experiments in the kind of work that I do now. So as you heard, I'm the executive director of the Story Collider. We're a nonprofit organization. We have live shows on stage similar to the moth, but it's true personal stories about science. Those shows are based in places like London, DC, Boston, New York, and LA. And we also have a weekly podcast. This is what we sound like in our intro. Science story, huh? Is NYU scientist the... I felt it. I was so and happy. I thought, well, I figured it, out. it was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. So we also do workshops. I spend a considerable amount of my time training researchers 
to understand narrative structure, and to get comfortable with the idea of storytelling. I know that the best way to help your audience understand what you're talking about is to meet them where they are and provide them with what they need, and scientists need data. So I started digging into the literature available, and you know, to the best of our understanding right now, we believe that stories are processed using cognitive pathways that are unique compared to other forms of communication like evidence-based argumentation. And because of the way they are structured, the way they are told, and, and, our, and our sort of neuroscience, they are more interesting, more understandable, more believable, and more persuasive. So I think it's also important to take a step back and recognize we can really dig into this, but when we look at humans as a species, just as you see social learning and things like New Caledonian crows, we have evolved stories as a mechanism for allowing learning. We package information about who we are, how we survive, and what matters to us, and we're able to spread it through space and time through the format of stories. I admit that when you're holding a big hammer, everything looks like a nail, and it's easy to think about all the ways in which stories might solve all of our problems. One of my favorite papers to recommend to people getting into risk science communication or science communication is this one by Baruch Fischoff. And I think it's important that we don't add, all we have to do is tell them stories to the end of this list of ontogeny recapitulating phylogeny when we think about entering a, a risk management situation. I borrowed the next slide from Andrew Maynard, but I actually managed to get this in a peer-reviewed book chapter. Risk we talked about already today, is about feelings as much as it is about likelihoods and probabilities. And I think this idea of risk as feelings and feelings being important to both the experience of and the way that we engage with health science communication is absolutely crucial. So I talk about the idea that we know people remember facts. They can tell us about facts, but they believe their inferences. And so I think storytelling has a really important place because we make inferences about the world around us. And stories are both products and processes for doing that. So one of the things that I think storytelling helps us get at is this question of what is it to be healthy? We talk about health science communication, but what's the goal? So I went to the World Health Organization, and they define health as this state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity complete. I don't know that any of us have ever achieved much healthiness in our entire life. And particularly when we start to think about these intersections of socioeconomics and race and gender and all the rest of it with what health means, um, if our idea of health is based on a young white male, that's functionally the spherical cow of health science communication. So if we ask, what is healthy, we also might ask, what is normal? Because this bears, this comes to play as well. When you think about the communities galvanized around issues like neurodiversity and autism, or about body positivity and, and obesity and body weight and the rest of it, um, there are voices out there waiting to be heard and finding lots of traction in many of the spaces online and in public media and the rest of it that we're attending to. I brought some voices with me, and I want to play you a short clip, an edited clip, from one of the Story Collider episodes. This is Emily Caudill. She went through a really intense series of, of chemotherapy and consequences of ovarian cancer. She's also a fiddle player from Kentucky. Even to open a bottle of water, so practicing was totally out of the question. As I began to get stronger, I started talking to other people about my hearing loss, and I gathered so much strength and encouragement from their stories. My friend, a professional drummer, was deaf in one ear. A cousin has been wearing hearing aids his entire life, and I never knew. A neighbor has been dealing with tinnitus after a life working in a factory with loud machinery. I was not alone. But I still felt sorry for myself, and so I decided that I was going to quit music. I declared my plan to my family, and my grandpa, who was 81 and sharper than a tack, said, my girl, you must never quit. I knew that he was right. When we hung up, I unpacked this instrument. 
I rossed up my bow, and I played through one of my favorite old tunes. I couldn't even remember the rest of the tune, and my muscle memory was shot, but I tried to play another one. I was out of tune, but still, I, I tried to play another one. I couldn't ever imagine enjoying music the same way that I used to, but still, something deep inside was saying, don't stop playing. So I set some goals. Practice for 20 minutes a day, every day. I set a timer and stood up and played long, slow bow strokes. And if I got to 20 minutes, I was done for the day. The highest octave sounded like a cat scratching on a chalkboard, but I played through it and I came back to it anyway. Every day I played it anyway. That was a year ago. Today I'm wearing hearing aids and I have um, a digital tuner clipped to my scroll so that I can see when the notes are out of tune, which is most of the time. I've had no evidence of disease now for 16 months. I miss the sound of rain. I miss that when the Andy Griffith show comes on. I may always have to wear hearing aids. I may never regain feeling in my feet or be able to see myself in the face of my child. But as long as I'm here, as long as the sun comes up and I can hold a fiddle in my hands, I'm going to keep playing. I don't think we can talk about health without talking about loss, about sickness, about the things we may never be or may never be able to recapture. In the paper I submitted, I talked about a paper by Frank who identifies three core narratives that people who are experiencing illness or vulnerability tend to tell. One is restitution, the return to health. Another is chaos, an anti-narrative, and where one thing is just leading to the next and it's spinning out of control with no resolution. And the final is a quest a search to be able to make sense of what has happened to them and how they can share that story with other people. Stories are products of our human need to attribute causality, to make sense of ambiguity, to point to our villains, to point to our heroes, to figure out who we are and how we live in these impermanent bodies and imperfect brains that we have. Those brains provide tantalizing, sorry, tantalizing visions as to the future of, I think, science communication and asking about the neuroscience of narrative structures and storytelling. I look to papers like this about speaker-listener neural coupling, the ways in which if I'm doing a really good job, your brains will be lighting up in similar patterns to mine, especially if I'm telling a sort of sensorily uh, evocative story. I think about some of the research I'm reading these days on the fact that because humans are primarily a visual species, or we evolved as one, that we keep our eyes wide open when there's important information or tension, and then we blink in moments of release, and you actually can see synchronized blinking rates in audiences that are well and truly involved in a story. I know that we've talked about the way that listening to stories can be incredibly important as an access way for gaining important information about the communities we might be wanting to reach. We know that they can be cathartic, and in fact that they can help chronic pain sufferers feel at least temporary relief from their conditions just by simply voicing those stories. I want to close with the idea of storytelling in the persuasive or educational sense, because I know a lot of people think about them as a strategy or a vehicle to get across health science messages. 
Right now I'm thinking in a lot about this idea of transportation. You know that feeling of really being sucked into a story where all of your cognitive energy is, de is dedicated to that. What we understand is that it is reinforced or reduced by two factors, including uncritical processing and intensive processing. So the reduction of counterargumentation as well as an emotionally intense experience. And then we can start to dig into the narrative factors. What makes a story a story? And how might you amp up either uncritical processing or intensive processing? We know that some of those things are dependent on the messenger. Some of them are qualities of the text itself. And that craftsmanship seems to really matter. I want to close with one more voice. This is Dr. Rachel Yehuda. She studies epigenetic inheritance of markers of trauma and the children of Holocaust victims. And in this example, she's, she is talking about how she came to the conclusions that she did, but also weaving her own life history into that piece. This was produced in partnership with uh, WNYC and Studio 360 with Kurt Anderson. I finally got invited to give my first plenary talk at an international meeting. And I was so excited, but I was also so pregnant. <laughs> with my third child, Rebecca, but I had to go. I knew that the cortisol findings were still considered dubious, and I had to take this opportunity to explain them. So I flew halfway around the world. I got to the meeting. I waddled up to the podium. I said, hi, I'm Rachel Yehuda. I'm pregnant. Does anyone know how I got this way? <laughs> of course you all do. Sex. Pregnancy results from sex. Oh, I should tell you that uh, at that time, that was actually a requirement. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure a lot of you have had that, too. And yet not everyone in this room is pregnant. For pregnancy to occur following sex can only happen to some people, and only under the conditions where the hormonal environment is just right. And what I'd like to tell you today is that I think the same thing is true about trauma and PTSD. PTSD doesn't happen to everyone who's exposed to trauma. It may just be in some people and only when the hormonal environment is just right and having low cortisol levels at the time of the trauma may make it really difficult to suppress the body's adrenaline levels, which creates the perfect environment for PTSD to develop. I've just told you the story of my first few years as a scientist. I had to be productive or my career wouldn't launch. But I also had to be reproductive or my family wouldn't launch. To my surprise, I found that the synergy of these two threads helped me find my scientific voice. Thank you. Science doesn't happen in a vacuum. And I do believe that, especially when we think about illness and health communication, we are asking to, to see, to understand, and to intervene in some of the most vulnerable moments of people's lives. Storytelling is powerful. It can be manipulative. And as I wrote in my paper, we have to make our peace with and apologize for and rectify a history of uh, manipulation, paternalism, and all these other negative connotations that come around when people hear me talk about narrative persuasion and storytelling. There are ethical considerations at play. And overall, I do really believe that it is a balancing act, that we need the best available science, like the things that are being presented here today, combined with the stagecraft, the things that we know from hosting shows, from selling tickets, from a podcast that has 60,000 listens, per week. So I think I would like to close in light of the fact that there were these shootings in Orlando. If I'm asking to make an argument about persuasion, I think my argument to you is that we can do this. We can do this ethically. We can do it with great craft, great skill, and a solid foundation in the science that's being told. So I'll close with the last words from a poem by Maggie Smith called Good Bones. I think this is true of health science communication as it is more broadly. Life is short, 
and the world is at least half terrible. For every kind stranger, there's one who would break you, though I keep this from my children. I am trying to sell them the world. Any decent realtor walking you through a real shithole chirps on about good bones. This place could be beautiful, right? You could make this place beautiful. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That was great. Um, questions? Go ahead. Hello, thank you. Um, so I kept returning to this idea throughout your presentation that we discussed earlier, how this idea that affirming people's identities when asking them survey questions may somehow mitigate opposition to the question. And that to me, resonated because I feel like in some way it's like you're affirming their story or acknowledging them or seeing them where they're at. And so I'm wondering, does that click with you? And in practical terms, how can we incorporate this complex idea of story into the work we do? And relatedly, do our research design somehow reduce stories and like how to overcome the practicality of research, but also the complexity of the human condition? That's so many questions, and I'll, I'll try and take them in, in chunks. So earlier, Brendan was saying that one of the problems is people are really good at sniffing out inauthenticity, and was particularly when someone is masquerading as something they're not to try and build rapport, it, it falls apart. Um, in my experience, so my dad is military, and um, I, but I don't signal that, and in fact, I come in a way from a different culture. I was at a wedding. The groomsman next to me sat down. I ordered. His head snapped like a snake. And he looked at me and he said, I had you pegged as a vegetarian the second you walked in here. And he wanted to talk climate and he wanted to talk evolution, obviously. Like, right? And I couldn't. But I could thank him for his service. I could talk a little bit about where he'd been stationed, his buddies. And then I started. I was not ready to argue those things. I didn't have the facts at my fingertips. So instead, I asked him about what he thought and why he thought that. And then I told him about the scientists I knew and, and the research papers I had read and what I thought I knew, what I wasn't sure I knew. And by the end of the night, I'm sure abetted by some alcohol, uh, he was he was teary-eyed. And he said, no one who disagrees with me has ever talked about me, talked about this stuff with me before without yelling at me and telling me I'm stupid. So I think when I, so I think about procedural fairness. I think about the voices that are not here in this room and should be. I think about, yes, that um, our identities really matter and that we should figure out ways to incorporate that into what's going on. I think for you, maybe, maybe the first steps are to look to inside the communities we are already a part of. So in your teaching, in your careers, like when we think about women in, in science and, and the rest of it, how, what are the ways in which we might be able to employ our personal stories, the things that are most authentic to us in service of these broader goals? So the goal of the Story Collider is to position science as a cultural object that people feel just as much affection and control and you know, investment in as they do with like Marvel Comics or something like that. And so I, I think of story very broadly. I do think it gets trained out of us, and, and for good reasons, too. I wanted to say I, I laugh, and sometimes I tweet. My favorites are things like, I wrote this down because it was just such a gem. Um, a sentence about the narratological insight that narratives are characterized by varying degrees of narrativity. <laughs> <laughs> or, <laughs> or an abstract that ended with the sentence, academics should resist pressure to use heavy jargon. And the title of that paper is Nominalizing and Denominalizing, a reply with keywords of passivization and reification. <laughs> <laughs> So I think we all tell stories all the time. We are just, we are storytelling machines. People virtually are just in this constant internal monologue and then we're looking to make sense of the world through that lens. So I think it's hard. The jargon matters. These ideas, especially in communications, it's tricky because like our natural language, we, we make all sorts of fallacious jumps or, or we think we know what we're talking about because we all talk every day and we all tell stories. So of course we should use stories, right? I think this stuff really matters, but then we need to find a way to bridge it back 
because quite frankly, a lot of the science communicators I know, especially when we go outside like this kind of audience, they think, what is the point of some of this social science? Like those people can't even string together two coherent sentences. How dare they tell us that we're doing it wrong? <laughs> Um, super interesting stuff. Um, I wonder if you, so now I'm going to throw a, an easy question to you of how to explain an issue that no one can explain. But um, so, I, so this got me thinking about where stories are most effective, what types of issues. Um, and there's certain things where, so like one thing you've described and what the story collider does, right, is humanize scientists that might address this kind of warmth idea or, or, or set it, you know, and that's a way to promote science in general. But if we're thinking about a specific issue, yeah. You know, there's there's certainly like kind of puff pieces about this person and their discoveries you can imagine, but um, let's say we're trying to talk about something like climate. There's a, it, it's a challenging issue because the scale of it almost defies a specific story. And so, what do you do? Well, you can tell you can tell a villain story, mm -hmm. right? So there's one thing we haven't talked about, which is like the kind of villain story of approach, or the other is the here's this poor person or like the poor bear on the ice floe, this poor animal that's been affected by this. Mm -hmm. um, but I wonder how effective you think those kinds of stories are versus the kind of scientists telling their own story. Well, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, I, I don't know. I, and I, I'm a person I like to have data on things before I speculate about them. So I often think about what are the ways in which all of these little individual stories are weaving together into a meta narrative that people approach and understand. I think there is some value in this idea of people actually talking to and hearing directly from scientists. So I'm drawing from stuff out of the um, informal science education community where people who met a scientist at some sort of museum event thought that they were more credible or felt more connected to them or more, were more convinced by hearing a scientist talk. I think especially if you hear a scientist talking about um, things that they weren't sure of before, how, like, how they got to where they believe, that that can be quite profound. Um, but I don't, I don't have good answers. Professor Kahan? Um, well, so just picking up on that, I got, and I, I was reflecting on this as you were talking, but it's almost as if, well, one thing we do here is we're talking about how do we communicate to the public certain X, Y, and Z of science, but, but a lot of it is that like science is just a thing to be consumed as a, a kind of product. Like, at least some people just really enjoy, and, and quite a number actually, the experience of learning how it is that we came to know something through the distinctive methods of science. And it's always as if there are two, there's a story inside a story. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I noticed this, like, say, in science podcasts, for example, um, <laughs> and they, they get the scientist to tell the story of how the scientists figured out something, yeah. and it's always a story of, well, people thought this, um, and we weren't sure, or I wasn't sure that that was right, or we were having a debate about this. Um, and what I did was uh, make this observation that made that possible. Um, now that is that exactly the story the scientist is telling to all of his or her colleagues, right? But in a kind of language that none of us can, or, or you know, unless we're in that field, can understand, yeah. the magic of the science communicator is they're telling us that person telling that person's story in the terms that we can understand. That's like the most amazing thing of the craft is finding the kind of like connecting uh, bridge of, of common understanding that makes that person's story. But it was that scientist's story of discovery, the one we can participate in as a story of doing what? Figuring out the answer to something you couldn't observe directly by looking at something you could and drawing an inference, right? And that, so it's just, it really, it's so intrinsic to the enterprise. Um, but actually, I thought you did that in describing how um, it was that you think about how you were going to tell um, science stories and enable that and even how you figured out how you're going to do that um and i guess you know i'm not sure if that's going to convince anybody to believe in climate change um but i sure as i'm convinced that that's very intrinsically valuable yeah i think i just want to make a clumsy attempt to link together two ideas this is half formed in my own head but going back to the challenges that we've heard and, and sort of struggled with already about 
uh, personal responsibility and sort of focusing on individual level re change, and then also the influence of elites. I feel like what we what we truly need is sort of uh, structural change at the society level, like infrastructure level differences when we talk about health equity or all these other things. And so I think that stories can be a mechanism by which you can catalyze individual change, that stories about individual change can influence elites, like the senator's daughter who was turning 18 and she said, Dad, if you don't get on board with climate change, I'm not voting for you when I'm legal, you know. Um, and then and that has trickled down. And I think so there's, there's that pathway. I think there's the the justice of being heard and incorporating people so that even when decisions go against an express policy preference, people see procedural fairness and believe that democracy works. And I think those things together will lead to the kinds of large-scale structural changes that we need to see to tackle these issues. We have Professor Eubel and then Professor Lupia and then uh, Graham Griffith. Now, Ann and I were talking a little bit after Brendan's uh, talk about how would you explain why autism rates are going up? And um, it seems like st um, when scientists would try to talk about diagnostic criteria and false negatives, false positives, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. But a couple stories could illustrate those concepts really well. If you, I can imagine a podcast with, where you're, you're getting to know two children, one of whom's quirky with some issues and one who's pretty severe, and then explain how at different points in time, only the one would have been diagnosed with autism and now both are and here's why and there's a social context because of funding for schools, et cetera. And it, so it seems like very complicated ideas. What stories can do is they can make it concrete. They can certainly make you care about it because these are kids and you want to know what's going on with them. And then when the scientific ideas come behind, yeah, so you knew all that. Well, so I was thinking this pairing is absolutely important because the what's different, so science communication is about, and science itself is, a, is a de about deductive reasoning, and we judge it by its ability to characterize reality and to be falsifiable. Stories, on the other hand, are judged by their verisimilitude, right? We judge them on the credibility of the storyteller and also like how plausible that world is and the emotional stakes involved and all the rest of it. So they're necessarily anecdotal. So I often see stories, and, and so in many instances, um, my colleagues and the people I'm training feel like it is somehow unethical at all to use storytelling or to use those mechanisms because especially when they evoke an emotional response in the audience, people who come up in certain traditions of hard sciences think that emotion runs counter to logic and that by triggering an emotional response, you are necessarily sort of going against, it's, it's, it's heretical somehow. And I, I very much see stories as a way into talking about what we know and then describing the process of of the science, as well as also how did we figure it out in the first place? People, like Dan was saying, people love that. So um, sometimes people ask at seminars, they ask questions that they know the answer to. Yeah. I want to ask you a question that I don't know the answer to, that I've really been struggling with. Um, so a lot of us, I think everybody on the panel and a lot of us here are, you know, part of what motivates you is you think that there's a set of ideas or the set of discoveries that if we could get them to certain people, we'd improve their quality of life, right? Mm -hmm. Part of why people fund something like this or part of why a lot of the work in the room gets attention is this notion that, well, we're not doing it. And, and Dan's point about, you know, thinking about how well it works and a lot of, it, I think is really good, but there are these cases where we're not doing it right. Um, and I think there's also a sense, I mean, part of what, why people fund something like this event is the idea that there's an asymmetry and we in the science or some of the health communities are, are bad at it. We're getting, as Dr. Viswana said, with, with like Coke spending a billion dollars a year to figure out how to do this and we're, you know, we're just flailing. So this is what I was thinking, like suppose we succeed, right? Suppose that we all kind of figure out how to do something and you know, tomorrow or next week, like everybody that we're thinking about is 15 or 20 percent better at telling stories, and that that these stories kind of convey the information and get some right. Right. So, Coke's still spending a billion dollars or 3.5 billion or whatever it is, and a lot of the people who we're competing with in in the information space, like they're trying to get better too. Yeah. Right. So, 
So here's my question. Like, if we all get 20% better at telling stories, like just ever, like like all of yeah. us and all of them, yeah. what's different? Like, because I, I like at my gut, I want to believe that it's, it's better. But you've thought so much about stories and what makes them work and how people can use them. Like, do you think we're better off or worse off? Well, so I don't know if this actually answers your question, but I often find we slip inadvertently into a broadcast assumption that if I'm 15% better at telling stories, maybe like I'll have a larger audience. Like the, that we think about footprint or imprint or something like that. Um, and when I think about stories, I think about it in this really decentralized way and being very compatible with the social media world in which I'm immersed. And so I think about um, the structure of networks. And so instead of asking about like how many people, how many connections I have, like am I a failure if my thing doesn't go viral? Um, I think about the, the closeness and the betweenness of these nodes, which means how information is flowing from groups. So Emily Willingham um, is the mother of autistic children. She writes um, about science and, and autism and lots of other things. And she talks about being trusted nerd nodes in networks. And so I think that, for me, the value of storytelling is that we are empowering people to be sharing their ideas with these networks in a very different way, in addition to whatever the broadcast stuff and like competing with Coke might be. Because when it comes down to it, I think people are influenced by and trust the people they love and are surrounded by. And so if, I, if my vision of the world being better includes all these you know, dimensions of health and wellness, as well as people valuing science and respecting it, I think we're best served in having lots of different voices all saying that in their own authentic way embedded in our, our natural networks. Graham Griffith has the next question. I wanted to, if, if you would talk a little bit more about process here and what you've learned in the last year or so is uh, gets the best story out of specifically scientists. You know, oh, we yeah. get people who, who we know they have information to convey, and this is all about how to convey it more effectively. But in the training process before people get up on stage, what are some of the best What parts? do we do? So um, once I've established credibility with my audience to let them know I take them seriously, I understand that nuance is really important in their work, I can speak their jargon, um, then I get them doing a brainstorming process. Because a lot of people say, oh, I love this story collider, but I, I don't have any stories. I'm like, yes, you do. You are full of them. You just don't recognize them because you're thinking too big about like exotic, sexy locations or Hollywood films, things like that. And so um, we actually use the Pixar film Inside Out. It's got relatively good neuroscience behind it about the major emotions, rage, sorrow, disgust, joy, sadness. Um, and so instead of asking people to brainstorm about sort of factually important events in their life or pieces of their science, we ask them to think about the emotions that they have experienced in their careers as a starting place. Um, so once they've figured out what story it is that they want to tell, um, our big piece of advice is um, start in the action. A lot of people not trained in storytelling, we want to be like, this is a story about blah, 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 and what am I going to do today? Instead, be like, so I was up to my knees in mud, stuck, and the sun was going down. Right? Start that way. Um, a lot of people, and the, the corollary to that is end in the action. A lot of times we'll tell the end of the story, and then we'll want this extended denouement of like, and this is what it means, and blah, blah, blah. But once you've, once you've resolved that central conflict, you've lost people's attention. They know what happens. So take that and pack it into the middle of the story. And then the final thing is, is like, kill your darlings. This is a piece of writerly advice. Like, figure out what battles you really need to fight. What do people, how much science do people need to, like, what is your central thing? Because often we, we're delusioning them. Skip's written about um, attention and chunking and sort of working active memory and things like this. So what we're looking for is a beginning, a middle, and an end. We need characters where things are happening to them. We like changes in status. Everybody loves to see like an underdog succeed or you know somebody who's really cocky brought low. Um, and from there, people just want to hear the authentic experiences of other people. So that's our advice in a, in a nutshell. Next question is by Professor Budesco. So many of us repeating your question in different words. What if people get better at telling stories, but the wrong people are getting bad, better at getting at the wrong? <laughs> 
people are already better at than we are at telling stories. I think that in most contexts, <laughs> okay. um, scientists are outgunned, outfunded, outcharmed. <laughs> I, 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 I think these are tools that we have shied away from and that we can legitimize in allowing to, that, and also that we can recognize. So for me, my own arc was, I started off incredibly skeptical about storytelling. I wanted nothing to do with people or conservation when I was working on those coral reef fish. I then was doing data analysis behind efforts around uh, seafood and extraction for the coral reef trade. I worked on policy and deep sea corals. And over and over and over again, I was beating my head against this wall of, I've got this great data. Why won't these people listen? And I hated them. And then I thought, if I don't have all these, if it's not fair that those people can make these appeals to emotions that I can't or say things that aren't true or they've got more money than I do, what do I have on my side? And the answer was the science. And the best available research, and at least my read of it, suggests that storytelling is absolutely critical if you want to engage with how people search for information, how they perceive and, and, and understand risk, and how they make choices in their own lives. Okay, we have time for one more question. Is there, is there another question? Are we ready to take a break? Okay, why don't we thank Disney.